Good morning. Well, I think the um, last time that I spoke, we um, went through an entire book of the Bible, although we didn't go through it in its entirety. We did a summary. But this time we're going to go through a whole book. But we're all going to go through the book, a whole text, because it's a very short little book. It's the book of Philemon. Um, and it's a great little book. I really enjoyed um, studying for this because what we're going to be doing this morning essentially is looking over the Apostle Paul's shoulder as he solves a problem in the church. And so by, by way of background, it's probably about the year 60 A.D. Uh, the Apostle Paul is in prison, and he has a problem. Um, he actually has a, a couple of problems. But interestingly, it's not the being in prison part that he considers the problem. Paul always took that in stride. Um, he always trusted in the Lord's sovereignty over his life. And we read things like Philippians 4.11 where he says, Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. And that even included being in prison. Um, Paul's primary concern was never for Paul. It was always for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it was particularly for the Gentile church over which Christ had personally made him an apostle. He was anxious that they be built up in the faith. He was anxious that they would withstand the attacks of the enemy, and he was anxious that they would stand firm for gospel truth. And so to that end, he's writing a letter to the church in Colossae to warn them about some false teachers there. Now, Paul didn't found the church there, but people who heard the gospel as a result of his ministry in nearby places like Ephesus took it back to the smaller city of Colossae, and converts were made, and a church was formed. And so in the case of Colossae, we learn from Colossians 1-7 that it was probably a man named Epaphras who was from Colossae who took them the gospel. And somehow also, perhaps through Epaphras, Paul was made aware of some false teaching that was going on at Colossae, and he felt a burden for the believers there. And so the book of Colossians that we have in our New Testament is the result of Paul's concern, of that concern. So that's one issue he's dealing with at this moment. Uh, but there was another issue that he was concerned about at the same time, a more personal issue. While he was in prison, he'd met a man named Onesimus. Onesimus was also from the city of Colossae. And through their relationship, Onesimus became a believer, and he proved so helpful to Paul that Paul calls him out in his writing to the church at Colossae in Colossians. And he calls him a faithful and beloved brother. But here was the problem. Onesimus, it turns out, was a wanted man. He was a runaway slave who had likely stolen from his master back in Colossae. And we don't have time to really go into this in detail, but I think by way of background, we need to say a couple of words about slavery in the Roman Empire because it plays a huge role in what is going on with Philemon and with Onesimus. Slavery, in short, in the Roman Empire was ubiquitous. It was, it was everywhere. Um, historian Mark Cartwright estimates that one in three people in Italy, so you're talking over 30% of the, of the population of Italy, and one in five, so 20% of the population, across the Roman Empire in general uh, were slaves. Slavery, Cartwright says, was the foundation on which was built the entire edifice of the Roman state and society. Um, The Roman senator, um, I believe it was the senator Seneca, tells of a proposal once in the Roman Senate that they were going to vote whether they should require slaves to dress in a certain way so they could be easily identified. They ended up voting it down because they felt if the slaves could look around themselves and see how many of them there were, it might give them ideas, right, that they could maybe not be slaves anymore. So the Romans had a a vested interest in protecting this institution on which they depended. And so they treated runaway slaves very harshly. It was a crime that could be punished very severely. In fact, the the slave master had kind of a free hand to handle the situation however he saw fit, up to and including the life of of the slave. Um, More pertinent to Paul's problem as well is it was also illegal to harbor a runaway slave. So Paul has to decide um, what he's going to do, right? He's he's said in Romans 13 that you should obey the civil government. He has said in the letter he's writing to Colossae, in chapter 3, beginning in verse 22, he has said, 
bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. And so again, it's not going to be the main focus of this morning, but I think what we'll see when we look at Philemon is that we cannot leverage Paul to support the notion that slavery is something Christians can participate in without being at odds with the teaching of Jesus Christ. I don't think, despite the, what we just read, and we can't go into all that today, I don't think we can leverage Paul to support the notion that slavery is okay for the very reasons we're going to look at um, in Philemon this morning. Um, one thing to remember is Paul wasn't dealing with a culture that claimed to be Christian for whom enslaving people should have been or would have been a contradiction, right? I think you could say that about the British Empire or maybe the United States before slavery was ended in those places. Based on what they claimed to believe, it should have been a contradiction, right, to have slaves. Um, and I think one of the reasons that it ended up eventually ending in those places was because that contradiction was evident to many people at some point. Um, but Paul here is dealing with a pagan culture, a culture for whom slavery held no contradiction. It was some people were slaves, some people weren't. It was just kind of a station in life. Um, in fact, it's possible that even many slaves in the Roman Empire would have perhaps seen nothing wrong with the institution itself, however much they disliked personally being a slave, because you find accounts of slaves who gained their freedom, became rich, and then bought slaves of their own, right? Because it's, again, that was just how life worked. Um, people had value because of their wealth or their power or their skills or other utility. They didn't have value in Roman culture as intrinsic image bearers of God. So the right thing under Paul's, in Paul's eyes under these circumstances, and we have to presume that it was the right thing in Onesimus' eyes as well, was to have him return to his master and make things right between them. But I think what we see is, in that making right, Paul's gonna call Philemon to a new standard. He's gonna call Philemon to a much higher standard. Because as much as Paul had a problem here, um, Paul also had an advantage. Um, in the providence of God, Paul knew Onesimus' master, a man named Philemon. And Philemon was a fellow Christian. And that's gonna guide how Paul handles this situation. So we're going to look this morning at something that's unique in the New Testament. It's a personal letter from Paul to an individual about a personal issue of Christian discipleship. And I imagine that Paul wrote many personal letters over the course of his life and his ministry, uh, but God in his providence chose to include this one among his special revelation to us to be preserved for all time. And, you know, as I, as I was studying this book, it, it just occurred to me as I was going through this that one of the takeaways from Philemon that really kind of hit me is the fact that it is even included in the New Testament, that it is even included in God's special revelation um, because it shows the care of God for the ordinary events of life that we go through. I mean, the God we serve is the God of Isaiah 6, right? High and lifted up with a train of his robe filling the temple. But he's also the God of Philemon. He's the God concerned about reconciling two obscure first century believers all for his glory. So let's delve into Philemon. And I want to do something that we don't usually get to do, and that is read the entire book that we're studying um, in one go. Because this was a short little letter, and this is how the original audience would have heard it, albeit in a different language, but they would have heard it in one go. So hear the word of the Lord as written by the Apostle Paul to Philemon under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your house, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers because I hear of your love and of the faith you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Accordingly, 
Though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my child, Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. I am sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel, but I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own accord. For this, perhaps, is why he was parted from you for a while, that you may have him back forever, no longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it to say nothing of your owing me, even your own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. At the, at the same time, prepare a guest room for me, for I am hoping that, through your prayers, I will be graciously given to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ, Jesus, sends greetings to you, and so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. So the first thing that I want to look at this morning from this letter is the context of this discipleship moment. And I want to do that looking at the salutation in verses 1 through 3. Um, because the first question that kind of came to my mind as I was reading that, those verses is why Paul included others up to and including the whole church in the salutation of this personal letter. You see, he says, to Philemon, my beloved fellow worker, and Aphia, most people believe that that was probably Philemon's wife, uh, Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your house. So this is a personal letter between Paul and Philemon. The question that kind of jumped out at me is why include these other people in the, in the salutation? You know, he writes personal letters to Timothy and to Titus about matters of the church or encouraging them in doctrinal matters. He just addresses it to them. He says in Titus, for example, to Titus, my true child in a common faith. Um, I think one reason for this is because discipleship and particularly fostering healthy relationships in the church is never just an individual matter. Right? It's about forming healthy Christians. It's not about forming healthy Christians just as individual units but it's about forming them in the context of the church into a healthy church. We're not called to grow in Christ merely for our own benefit, but for the benefit of others and for the strengthening of the church. Um, let's look at Paul's, uh, and we're going to jump back and forth, by the way, between Colossians and Philemon several times this morning because they are comp sort of companion letters. Let's look at Colossians 3, um, beginning in verse 12. Paul says, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. So Paul gives instructions on how to live with one another in one letter to this church, and then in another letter, he has basically a textbook example they can use to show how to put that into practice. I think that's just incredible in the, in the providence of God. So Paul's goal with this letter was to reconcile Philemon and Onesimus, but not for them alone, but for the building up of Christ's church at Colossae, and indeed for our benefit still today. He wants their relationship to be a model of Christian love and forgiveness. Now, one thing that might come to mind is, well, does that mean everybody in the church always has to be involved in every interpersonal issue? Um, and the answer is no. I don't think that that's what Paul is, is saying here, what this letter is teaching us. Um, but if you remember from a couple weeks back, Zach told us that the church at Ephesus was a fairly small church. Well, the one at Colossae was even smaller because Colossae was a much smaller city um, than Ephesus. 
And so I would say it's very likely, in fact, it's probably certain that the church that met in Philemon's house knew about the situation with Onesimus. They probably knew he'd run away. They might have known that he'd stolen from his master. So he's going to show back up bearing these letters, and it's going to be important for everyone in the church to know how to handle this situation, right? To know how to receive him. How should we treat this man? And they're going to be looking to Philemon for direction there. And William Hendrickson, in his commentary on Philemon, says, although Philemon himself must make the decision, the others too must hear the letter. Let them therefore assist Philemon to do his duty. Let them also hear how Paul, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, would solve the important problem of the fugitive slave. Their minds too will thus be illumined and their sympathies broadened. So if Philemon does this well, it will be a teaching moment for the church on extending the grace of God to someone in that society they lived in would have considered perhaps unworthy of receiving that grace. Philemon is going to have to swallow his pride. He's going to have to treat as a brother someone he once treated as a slave. And that's not going to win him any points in Roman society. In fact, that might mark him as a problem. So Philemon needs the support of his church family to do the right thing as much as they need to see his example of godly leadership here. So do you see how the church is an independent or an interdependent body? In Colossians 1.24, Paul says, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church. Paul's suffering is for the church. Philemon's obedience will be for the church, not just for Philemon and not even just for Onesimus. So that difficult conversation that um, you need to have, that difficult stand you need to take that may put you at odds with the culture or at odds with your family, that can be used by God as a gift to the church if done wisely and well. So let's move on now to the content of the letter and let's see how Paul approaches this situation and let's see what is he asking Philemon to do here. It's very interesting that Paul begins his letter to Philemon very similarly to how he began his letter to the Colossian church at large. If you look at Colossians 1, 3 and 4, we read this. We always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for the saints. Now compare that to Philemon verses 4 through 6. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers, because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have for the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. So Paul has no doubt that Philemon is a faithful member of the church that meets in his house. He greets him essentially in the same way that he greeted the church in general. Although the you, when he's addressing Philemon, I remember you in my prayers is singular, so he's talking directly to Philemon with the others who've received the letter sort of looking on, I guess you could say. Um, he goes on, verse 7. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. So we get, he lets Philemon know. He, Paul, has personally benefited from Philemon's ministry. And he knows that other believers have benefited from Philemon's ministry too. You know, just as an aside, it never hurts to let our brothers and sisters know how much we appreciate them and how they have impacted our lives. I mean, I think that's particularly true if we need to have a difficult conversation of some kind with them because it shows that we're doing that out of love for them. And so it's out of the overflow of this that Paul's gonna make a request. Although I think it might be better to say Paul's going to expect Philemon to continue to treat fellow believers the way he has been treating them. And boy, do I have a guy for you, Philemon, a guy who needs some refreshment and some of that rest that you're famous for providing. Oh, his name is Onesimus. Oh, hey, Paul, wait a minute. That guy, he defrauded me and he ran away. You know, sometimes it is 
many times, <laughs> it is easier to be merciful and loving to people we don't know than it is to people we do know, uh, particularly if the person has hurt us or harmed us in some way. Forgiveness is often more appealing in the abstract, isn't it? Unfortunately, we're never called to exercise it in the abstract, right? We're called to live it out in the body of Christ in specific circumstances. Remember what we read earlier in Colossians chapter 3, verse 13, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. So Paul's writing that to Philemon as much as he's writing Philemon to Philemon, okay? Paul knew what it was like to be on the receiving end of this, by the way. Um, after his conversion, when he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the Christians there. They were afraid to let him because of who he used to be. And it wasn't until a trusted brother named Barnabas sort of came alongside him, vouched for him, they were able to gain their trust. And Paul is sort of playing that role for Onesimus. And we can do this for others. We're, in fact, called to do this for our fellow believers. To the brothers and sisters at Galatia, perhaps as much as a decade earlier, Paul wrote in chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. What is the law of Christ there? I think 1 John 4.21 spells it out well. It says, And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God, must also love his brother. And so Paul wants Philemon to do this for Onesimus. And so what is that going to look like? What would, a, what would Philemon need to do? What would Paul have him do? Well, that's what we get to next. He's greeted him warmly. He's encouraged him as a fellow believer. He's built him up in the faith. And now he's going to leverage that to call on Philemon to do the right thing. And you might say, well, wait a minute, that sounds kind of manipulative, right? But I think it's more of setting an expectation. Paul has said, here's your testimony, Philemon. Here's what you say you believe. Now, here's a chance to live it out. In fact, he says, I expect you to live it out. Notice the beginning of verse 8. Some translations say, therefore. Some translations say, accordingly. Um, Hendrickson expounds on this accordingly in his commentary. He says, take it this way, basically. Paul is saying, Philemon, since you're the kind of person who delights in refreshing the hearts of people, since you're a firm believer in loving and sharing, I've got an opportunity for you. So Paul is saying, what I'm about to ask of you is in keeping with what I've just said about your faithfulness, about your dedication to the Lord. I'm not going to ask you to do something out of sync with what you say you believe and the way that you're already living. I'm just going to ask you to extend that to yet another person, a person you may not thought of extending that to. I think it's good sometimes, I know it is for me, to remind ourselves and to remind others of our confession, of what we say we believe. Because we can be blinded by difficulty. We can be blinded by having been wrong. As Zach reminded us a couple weeks back, we can sometimes forget our first love. So we see in verses 8 through 10, Paul has the authority, he says, to order Philemon to do what he needs to do. He says, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you I, Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my child, Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. So he has the authority to command Philemon to do this thing, but he chooses not to use his authority in that way. I think a couple of things to notice here. Paul, what Paul wants him to do is required, right? It's not a suggestion. It's a command from an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's not optional. That means if Philemon doesn't do it, then he is sinning. But yet Paul doesn't command him to do it. Why not? I think it's because God is always concerned about the heart. Notice Paul's instructions in 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7 regarding giving. He says, each one must give as he has decided in his heart, 
not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So just as with Philemon, Paul doesn't want to compel the Corinthian Christians to give, even though that's a requirement for Christians. And we see this theme in the Old Testament as well, carried over several places into the New. Hosea 6, verse 6, For I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God, rather than burnt offerings. So Christianity is not about rote obedience, about just following instructions. It's about living life out of the overflow of what God has done for us. So Paul is writing on behalf of Onesimus, but he also wants the best for his brother Philemon, which is genuine heartfelt obedience, not reluctant rule following. If Philemon obeys out of compulsion, it'll still benefit Onesimus to some degree, but Paul's goal is that both men benefit. And that should always be our goal when we're seeking to reconcile two believers. It's not pitting one person against another, even if one person is in the wrong. Now, of course, there, there may be times when the one in the wrong is unwilling to repent and you must make demands upon them. But the goal is always for both to respond to the situation in a way that honors Christ. And that's what Paul's seeking here. It's also worth noting that um, Paul reminds Philemon of his own track record in this passage, he, he, that he's now in chains for the gospel, that he's lived a long life of service to the Lord. So Paul is not asking something of Philemon that he's not living out in his own life. In fact, the sacrifice that he's about to ask of Philemon or that he is asking him to make is kind of small potatoes compared to some of the sacrifices that Paul has made. And I think we would do well to remember that ourselves, thinking not just about Paul, but about Christ. The, the, the difficult things that we're asked to do pale by comparison in the sacrifice that Christ has made on our behalf, what Christ has done for us. In another letter to the Philippians, Paul says in Philippians 2.4, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grounded, to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So no difficulty that we're asked to face, no difficult situation we're asked to reconcile is going to be more difficult than the one who has paid for our salvation has gone through. So now kind of on to the main event. What specifically is Philemon supposed to do? What does Paul want him to do? Beginning in verse 11. Formerly, he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. I am sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own accord. For this, perhaps, is why he was parted from you for a while, that you may have him back forever, no longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant as a beloved believer, especially to me, but how much more to you in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he's wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. So Paul begins that section with a play on words. Onesimus' name actually means useful. And so Paul is pointing out the change in Onesimus since coming to Christ. Formerly, certainly from Philemon's perspective, he didn't live up to his name. But now he's a changed man. Now he's useful. Much more than as an obedient slave, but because he's a brother in Christ. He's useful to both Paul and Philemon in their mutual goal to advance the kingdom of God. So his usefulness has expanded from the mundane chores of everyday life to the eternal realm because Onesimus is now concerned about eternal things. I mean, think about this. He's willing to go back to his master not knowing the outcome because he recognizes God is in control and will work out all things for good. He has a new perspective, and Paul is asking Philemon now to have a new perspective as well. He would have liked Onesimus to stay with him as a fellow worker, but he realized Onesimus would be in a precarious position if he continued with Paul, apart from the blessing of his master. 
It would have actually had left Onesimus in a precarious legal position. He could have been arrested at any moment if he was caught. Um, and it would have possibly created tension in the church if it became known that Paul was breaking the law by harboring a runaway slave. You know, sometimes the thing we most want to do, the thing that seems to make the most logical sense is sometimes not the wisest and best course of action for advancing the kingdom of God. It's sometimes either easier, easy to justify something else. Sure, you know, Onesimus ran away. Sure, he stole from his master. Um, but now he's a Christian, and he's ministering with Paul, and he's doing these good things. What sense does it really make to send him back, right? Um, I had a friend many years ago who committed a crime while he was an unbeliever. And the circumstances were such that he'd likely never have been caught. After becoming a Christian and having confessed this action to other believers, he was urged by them to go to the police and to turn himself in for having committed this crime. He was now involved in ministry and he was doing good things, right? What sense does that make? Well, he did that. He went to the police. He admitted that he'd done this. And he ended up spending, I think it was several months in jail as a result. Um, and he said on the other side of that that it made him a stronger believer and it also bore witness to the church of the newness of life that he possessed in Jesus Christ. So sometimes doing the thing that makes the most sense is not the best thing. So Paul sends him back with an appeal to Philemon to no longer treat him as a slave, but to treat him as a brother in Christ. So here's the question that comes up, and people have asked this for generations, I guess. Was Paul asking Philemon to set Onesimus free? Um, I think at the very least he was asking him to stop treating him as a slave, even if that didn't mean full manumission. But if you look at the requests, it's hard to think otherwise. Paul says, treat him like a fellow brother in Christ. Receive him as you would receive me. You know, it's hard not to connect that with verse 22 where he asks Philemon to prepare him a guest room. He would receive Paul as a guest, as a fellow believer. I think you have shades there of the prodigal son. Don't treat him like a slave. Treat him like one who was lost and who now was found. Spurgeon says, this is, says of this that just as we stand before the Father, received as if we are Christ, Paul is asking that Onesimus be received as if he was Paul. Don't worry about what he owes you, Paul says. I'll pay that. If there's an obstacle of money, I'll take care of that. And again, I think we have shades of the gospel here where our debt is paid by another so we can stand in freedom before the Father. So Paul goes out of his way to do anything he can to restore the relationship. And this should really be our posture as well because relationships between followers of Christ supersede all other earthly relationships and connections that we share. Galatians 3.28, Paul says, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. Now that doesn't mean those distinctions cease to exist, right? It's certainly not an argument that male and female are not real distinctions. Just that those things are secondary at best behind our identity as brothers and sisters in Christ. And so if the relationship between Philemon and Onesimus changes in the way Paul requires, Philemon and Onesimus each will have to die to themselves and embrace the other as a brother in Christ. Onesimus has to lay down his resentment against his master. Philemon has to forgive him. And I believe that precludes all that we've just said, Onesimus remaining a slave. So the band can, can come back up now as we, I'm, I'm gonna be over time a minute, so I apologize for that, but you guys can come back up as we conclude the matter. Verses 22 through 25. Notice that you see at the end, um, Paul assumes the best of Philemon. He, he assumes that he will do what is required. And he's so confident of that that he plans to visit as soon as he can. And he also encourages Philemon with the knowledge that other believers both affirm him as a believer and affirm that what Paul is asking him to do is the right thing. And he ends with prayer for God's grace to be poured out on Philemon without which he will not be able to do what is required. We need each other we need the grace of God to live as a healthy Christian community. So I know you may be wondering what happened to Philemon and Onesimus. Um, as much as we'd like to know the 
for sure answer to that, we really don't. Um, Zach mentioned a couple weeks back the letter of St. Ignatius to the Ephesians. In this letter, he mentions a bishop at Ephesus named Onesimus, who's serving in the Ephesian church. And many have speculated that this is the same Onesimus of, of this letter. But others point out that Ignatius' letter was over 50 years after Paul penned Philemon. So while it's possible, because I'm, we have the example of Polycarp, who lived to, to over 80, um, given the lifespans of the day, it's probably not likely. And Onesimus, even though it sounds odd to us, was a very common name back in that day. Um, so could he have been a bishop at Ephesus at 75 or 80 years of age? He could have, but we just don't know. Um, some have also speculated that the Onesiphorus mentioned in 2 Timothy, who ministered to Paul at the end of his life, is the same guy, is uh, Onesimus. But again, we don't know for sure. Um, but I believe that Philemon did do what Paul asked him to do. I think the fact that the early church preserved this letter with Paul's other letters and that it eventually was included in the canon is evidence that Philemon and Onesimus were reconciled and they were no longer master and slave because that would be the significance of this letter is the result that it produced and the teaching of the church in that. But the good news is we don't have to know the outcome to know that the Holy Spirit superintended the writing and inclusion of this letter in the canon. What we have in Philemon is a beautiful example of Paul putting his money where his mouth is, using what he taught others in order to minister to a friend, reconcile a relationship, and strengthen the church. And so may we learn from his example as we walk together as a body. So let's pray. Father, thank you for this reminder of our call to unity, of our call to forgive one another as we have been forgiven. Use this letter from Paul to help us embrace that and to walk in it. We ask these things in Christ's name.